just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all that you've done for me. Blessings and glory. and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday night for Bible study. We give God all the praise and all the honor for allowing us to come again, come together once again. We pray that you will click the share button and start a, a watch party with your family and friends. I have a question for you. And the question is, are you interested or committed? Are you interested or committed? When you're interested in something, you will do it until you lose interest in it. But if you are committed, you will let nothing keep you from doing whatever it is that you are committed to. When you're committed to something, you're passionate about it. You spend time and effort in doing whatever it is. When you are interested in God, you only seek him when it's convenient or when it's necessary or when you're in trouble. But when you are committed to God, you seek him first. You spend lots of time with him because that is, the, that is one of your most favorite things to do. You know, God has blessed us to see 2021. Let's be committed in giving God our time, our talents, and our treasures. Our scripture comes from Psalm 31 through five. And it reads, I will exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. You refuse to let my enemies triumph over me. Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, oh, Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. I'm going to read verse 5 again. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory. Just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, yeah, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. just want to serve you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. 
blessings and glory and honor, yeah, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. We thank you for another privilege. Thank you for another honor. Thank you for another opportunity just to call on you. God, we glorify you. We magnify you. We lift you, Father God, before other men. For we know, Father God, you're the only one who can help us in times like these. God, we honor you, Father God, for we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise because you are just good and you are God. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, for our disobedience, for missing the mark, for trespassing, for falling short. God, we ask you to forgive us now. We ask you to bless your word that your word will mean much to us, that your word will fall on good soil. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to Bible study. Bible study. We're in Colossians chapter 4. We're in Colossians chapter 4. Uh, last time we were together, we uh, closed out with Colossians chapter 3. And now we begin Colossians chapter 4. I will look tonight to cover two particular pericopes here tonight. Verse 1 is a pericope in itself. Verse number 1, Colossians chapter 4, verse number 1 is a pericope all by itself. It is one central thought all by itself. It is one complete thought all by itself. And therefore, it is a pericope all by itself. Hallelujah. So we're looking at verses 1 through 5 on tonight. Let me call your attention to Colossians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Colossians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Thank you so much for joining us to our visitors. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. We look forward to sharing with you what the Lord has said to us. As you look through your Bible and find Colossians chapter 4, Remember, we are doing our Bible, daily Bible listening in our journaling. So what we're doing is we're going from Genesis to Revelation straight through by the end of the year. We're listening to the Bible. We're listening to the Bible. Um, we're going from Genesis to Revelation straight as it is written. Uh, we're listening to the Bible. And as we listen each and every day, we are journaling. We are journaling. I think today we are, we closed out with uh, Genesis chapter 23. If you're behind, it's time for you to catch up. Amen. I think we finished today with Genesis chapter 23. So if you're behind, you got to catch up. It's, it's almost, it averages out to be four chapters a day. So go ahead and catch up. And then when we get to the New Testament, it's not as many chapters. So go ahead and catch up so we can be on one accord the word of God is important. The word of God is important to us. I'm not asking you to read it. I'm asking you to listen to it by way of your electronic gadgets. Listen to the word of God. And as you listen to it, journal what God is saying to you. Write down what God is speaking to you. Amen. We also have our daily Bible reading 
that comes out weekly. I, I usually text it out every Monday morning, uh, our daily Bible reading that leads up to our Sunday school. We just can't get enough of God's word. Let's mm -hmm. just stay with the word of God. If we stay with the word of God, we won't have so much, so much shenanigan going on. Amen. Colossians chapter 4. It is a very uh, opportune. It's a very opportune scripture for today. Colossians chapter 4. Let's look at verse number 1. It's a pericope in itself. Verse number 1 says, Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair knowing that you also have a master in heaven. <laughs> masters, uh, employers, masters, uh, those who are over you, those who have control, those who are controllers, masters, those who are supervisors, masters, those who are managers, masters, give respect to your bond servants. Give your bond servants what is just and what is fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This word master means that one which controls. That one who is Lord, meaning that you Lord over somebody. This word master, we just came out of chapter 3 of Colossians. Chapter 3 closes out with what the Christian home should be governed by. Opens up chapter 4 talking about those who are in control, those who are masters. It says to us, whether you are a parent whether you are an employer, whether you are a supervisor, whether you are a manager, whatever you do, give those who serve under you. This word bond servant is servant or another word during those days were slaves. Paul says, if you have control over people, be fair to them. And be just to them. Masters, those, whether you are a parent or an employer, be fair. This word just means be righteous. The word servant is the word that we get, the same word that we get the word slave. In Paul's day, this word bond servant or servant was those who was under subjection. He's saying those who are above, those who have ministering power. He also speaks to pastors. Those who have ministering powers, those who have guidance, those who have authority over others who are under subjection, those who are under you, make sure you deal with them justly. He used the same word we get the word slave. This word bond servant means servant, but it also means slave. He says, treat slaves right. You see, the idea here is, that masters needed to treat slaves right or employees right, number one, because during this time, even though you were a master, it was a great possibility that you also could become a slave. Just because you're in the driver's seat now does not mean you're going to always be in the driver's seat. We are seeing it play out all over America. We don't have to look at the world. If we just look at America only, politicians, not public servants, because they are far from being public servants, politicians, 
be careful how you treat people because your day is coming. He says, masters, the one who's in control now may not be in control tomorrow. Whatever you do, because you're in control, don't be dogmatic about it. He says, master, treat your bond servants, treat your slaves in a manner that is just. Treat them in a manner that is righteous. Treat them in a manner, a manner, a manner that is of good character. In other words, you treat them in such a manner that it will come back to you as innocence. It says when you deal with them, be thoughtful of them. Govern them according to God's divine laws. Treat them right. Treat them with principles. Masters, give your bond servants what is just. And when you do something for them, make sure it is just. Make sure it is right. Make sure that how you treat other people is how you would like to be treated. Treat them just. And then the second word, he says, treat them fairly. Meaning treat them equally. Treat them equally as you would treat other masters. And also treat them equally as you would treat other slaves. This word fair means to treat them with equality. We know that all men are created equal because God made all of us equal. Yes, right. And because God made all of us equal, if you're in control, make sure you treat your fellow man or make sure you treat those who are subservient to you with good quality, good character, treat them fairly, meaning treat them as if they are your equal. Masters, those in control. It's just amazing how the tide can change so quickly. You can be in control today and out of control tomorrow. You can be in control for four years, and in four years, mm -hmm. you're reaching and grabbing and don't want to let go of that control. Mm -hmm. You can be in control, but your control has to come to an end. Let me just serve notice on you. Your control has a term limitation period. Yes, right. Look at what he says. He says, masters, give your bond servants, your slaves, Give those who are under you, those who serve under you, what is just, what is fair, and you want to do it because, number one, you know that you can be a slave too. And he says in the text, do it knowing that you also have a master in heaven. You know, God is such an awesome God. God is such an amazing God. God is such a good God until he did not leave any stone unturned. Just as I have dominion over someone, God has dominion over me. Says, treat them righteous. Treat them just. Treat them fairly. Masters, those who are in control, those who are, who are over somebody else, even if it's a husband, treat her fairly. Even if it's a wife, treat him fairly. And I know some wives have control. Some wives are running things. 
And, and they'll tell you, they'll tell you, yeah, he's the head, but I'm the neck that turns the head. Let me share with you, sister, that's not biblical. What I'm saying to you today, whatever position that God has allowed you to be in, because there are some positions that we are in, God just allowed us to be in it. He didn't place us in it. And if God has allowed you to be in that spot, make sure you do all you can do to treat people right. Many times people give their two weeks notice. Some people don't even give a two weeks notice, but, but many times people give their two weeks notice and they just shut down, stop doing any work for that two weeks. Mm -hmm. Let it be said by you and let it be said by others about you that he or she worked up until their last moment. Yes. If, you, if you are a servant, you, you deal with your stuff righteously. That's right. Because the fact of the matter is, just as you are Lord over somebody else, and that's Lord with a small L, sooner or later, you're going to have to answer to the Lord who is in heaven, that's Lord with the large L. It says, make sure you understand that you have a master, a controller, a Lord, a master, a sir, a supreme authority. And one of these days, you as a master today will have to answer to the supreme authority, not only today, but from now on. It says, treat them, treat them. So it says, employers, owners, pastors, ministers, husbands, wives, coaches, principals, teachers, treat those who serve under you fairly. Yes. Treat them well. Because number one, sooner or later, the tables could turn. The same person you're lording over can one may be your Lord. Mm -hmm. The same person you, you downing today will one day have to pick you up. Yeah, that's right. We see it on display all day, every day. The election has been over. The certification took place in November. We're just going through the motion now. But don't be a soul loser because your time is up. Mm -hmm. Let me just share with you. If you are serving the Lord now, mm -hmm. give God all you have yeah. because our time is running out. Yes, sir. As a pastor, as a, as a leader, as a preacher, I want to make sure that I give God my very best now. Because not far behind me, there's a young man coming behind me that will lead the New Beginning Church farther than I can ever dream of taking it. Yes. And there's no sense of me being upset with him or jealous of him because God uses him to do great things, I need to run my race like it's a marathon and also run my race like it's a 40-yard dash. Okay. I need to give God all I have now, pour into every person I can pour into now because God is raising up a young man right now that's going to take my place, that's going to lead this church into another century if the Lord tarries. And there's no sense in me living my life as a minister, as a pastor, or ministering haphazardly and then get jealous when the young man stands up to do what he has to do. I'm telling you, treat people right now. Run for the Lord now. Sister Davis asked the question, are you interested in God? Or are you committed to God? Yes. 
I, I haven't heard any talk because we're not in, in session in person, but but uh, usually, I'm, I'm so glad not at the New Beginning Church, usually when a pastor puts out something that says, hey, make sure you listen to the word daily, there's some complaining. I'm just asking you to listen to the word. I'm asking you to journal the word. Just write down what God is speaking to you. Well, preacher, if I listen to it, why I got to write it down? Number one, because God has unctioned the pastor to tell you to do it. Yes. Number two, you ought to be excited about the word of God. And number three, you ought to be desperate to hear what God has to say. Yes. You ought to be ready. You ought to be popped up. I'm so glad, Pastor Davis, what took you so long to come to this conclusion? Mm -hmm. We should have done this years ago. Well, we did do it years ago. And you ought to be able to go back and find your notebook from years ago and see what God spoke to you then and then see what God is speaking to you now. And it will be the same and it will be different. Because God has new mercies every morning. I'm saying to you, you need to be committed and not just interested in God. Your, your, your walk, your talking, that's part of verses three, two, two, three, two through five, your walk, your lifestyle will say to you, will say to God and will say to people, whether you walking in the Lord or not. It says, masters, give your bond servant, give your slave, give those who are subservient unto you just and fair treatment knowing that your father in heaven, your master in heaven, your controller in heaven, your Lord with a large L is watching you. Verse number two, continue earnestly, continue earnestly. This word continue means to persevere, to draw, to be honestly drawn to, to be diligent. Continue. Be constantly diligent. Make sure you continue and be instant. That's the same word we get the word instant. Be continually, be instantly in prayer. Be instantly in prayer. This word prayer means worship. You see, we ought to use our prayer time as a time for worship. That's why the way we begin our prayer ought to be one of worship. Jesus says to his disciples, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We glorify you, Lord. Lord, we lift you. Your name is holy. You are glorious. God, we praise you. Our prayer time ought to be worship time. We ought to be excited about getting along with God. I'm, I'm talking about you having your private moment with the awesome God of the universe. You by yourself, just you and God talking to each other. God talking to me and me talking to God. What a refreshing moment. You won't be mad all the time if you talk to God all the time. Be constant in prayer. Be, be diligent in prayer. Being vigilant. Verse number two says, continue honestly in prayer. Being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Whatever you do, with all you have, worship God in prayer. This word prayer, this word continually means to to give all you have to the Lord in your quiet time. Be diligent. Be honestly involved in prayer. Being vigilant. Being vigilant. Being vigilant. You have to make sure you get to a point in your life where you're excited about being with God. You got to get to a point in your life where, where God expects to meet with you and you expect to meet with God. 
This word vigilant means to have your eyes open, to be alert, to, to look for God and allow God to look for you. Being vigilant in prayer. You be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. This word vigilant means to be watchful. Thanksgiving means to have a, a grateful attitude. Lord, I know it's not what I wanted to be, but Lord, I'm thank you, thankful for it. You may not have received all that you wanted to receive in 2020, but you need to be thankful for what God has done if he has done nothing but cross you over to 2021. Yes. None of us know what 2021 holds. We believe that since we have crossed over into 2021, we have a brand new lease on life. And that is true. Every moment of our lives, we have new mercies every moment not to mention every morning. Yes, and we ought to be thankful. We ought to have gratitude. We ought to be grateful for it. And this word thanksgiving is also an act of worship. It's an act of worship. It's, a, it's an act of aiming our prayers, aiming our gratitude, thanking God for what God has done. Meaning while praying also for us that God will open to us a door for the word to speak the mysteries of Christ for which I am in chains that I may make the make manifest as I ought to speak. Let's back up and see what Paul is saying. In verse number two, he says, continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant, be alert, be awake, be vigilant, be watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. And he says, meaning while praying, also pray for us. Paul is in prison. Paul is locked up. And he was there because of the word of God. How you know, preacher, it's right there in the verse. It says, while praying also for us, that God will open a door for the word to speak the mysteries of Christ for which I am also in chains. I'm already locked up. Now, there will be some of us. If we were locked up because of the word, the last thing we want to do is talk about the word if we're locked up because of the word. The very last thing we want to talk about is the word of God if we locked up because of the word. But Paul says, I want you in your prayer time. Pray also for us because there are other folk locked up for us. And next week he will list all those other people that are locked up with us. He says, also praying for us that God will open a door for the word. We are living, walking epistles of the word of God, and we ought to always look for God to open the door. Yes. And when he opens the door, we don't want him to open the door for shenanigans. We want God to open the door so we can present God's word. He says, look at it. He says, says in verse number three, Colossians chapter four, verse number three, he says, meaning that when you pray, pray also for us, that God would open a door that God will open a door for the use of the word, for the presentation of the word, for the development of the word. Mm -hmm. You want God to open the door so the word can step in, not so you can step in. Mm -hmm. The problem today is that we trying to step in when God has really opened the door for him to show himself mighty and for his, his word to step in. Yes. Just the other day, preacher, man of God, decided he's going to be politically inclined, decided that he was going to include women in the midst of his prayer. He says, this we pray, didn't even say Jesus' name. He said, this we pray, a man and a woman. How ignorant. 
How uninformed, how prideful, how people pleasing can you be? A man and a woman not knowing that a man is not talking about the gender of a man. Matter of fact, it's not a man. We say a man is really a men. So what he decided to do, he decided that he was going to tack on a woman so he can be prideful, so he can be a people pleaser, so he can be politically correct, so he can include the women into his prayer. But at the end of the day, had he known what a man need means he would not have put a woman on there or a woman on there. This is the kind of ignorance that I want the New Beginning Church to recognize right away. A man and a woman, a preacher, who wants to be politically correct, but if you're theologically correct, you won't have to worry about being politically correct because we're in the shape we're in right now because the man said, I'm going to Washington. I'm, going to, I'm not going to be politically correct. I'm going to Washington. I'm going to drain the swamp and made it a sassy pool. Ignorance. Uninformed. We have to want the word of God. And we don't want excitement. We want the word of God. And if the word of God brings excitement, that's just icing on the cake. Paul says, pray for us also. That God would open the door for the word. We want God to open the door for the word of God. So we can be a presentation for the word, not a presentation of ourselves. One of the worst things I hated, I, I hated in, in corporate America is that you have to do your own self-evaluation. You have to do your own self-evaluation and tell them of all the great things you've done and how great you are in order for you to get a pay increase, in order for you to get a good grade on your report card or your evaluation. I thought that was the worst thing in the world because throughout church and throughout our lives in our households, we teaching our children, don't brag on yourself, let somebody else brag on you. That's right. That's right. But if you don't give yourself a good evaluation and then go in and defend your evaluation, then you probably going to get a slip that you don't want. It's one of the worst things in corporate America. They want you to evaluate yourself. When we looked at verse number one in chapter four of Colossians, it says that there will be evaluation from the master who is in heaven. The, the second problem I had with it, because I thought it was a cop-out for management. Management want me to evaluate myself so they won't have to evaluate me. What I said is, be a man about it. <laughs> tell me what you really feel. <laughs> tell me how you really feel about it. Don't let me tell you what I feel about me. You tell me what you feel about me. And then God will always open the door. You want God, and we ought to be praying, God, open the door. God, uh, open the door. If God opens the door... I can step in the door and present the word. Paul says, I want you all to pray for us that God will open a door for the word. Mm -hmm. The reason why he needed God to open the door is because there were some strongholds against the word of God. But if God opens the door, then the strongholds have to come down. He says, pray that God opens a door for the word to speak the mysteries of Christ for which I am in chains. Listen to this. What sense does this really make? I'm already in chains. 
I'm already locked up. I'm already in prison because of the word, because I've been speaking the great mysteries of Jesus Christ. I've been speaking the mysteries of Jesus Christ, and because I've been revealing those things, this word mystery means the silent things. Word mystery mean the, means the, the things that are hidden, the things that are shut up in other men's mouths, the things that other men will not speak and other men don't know to speak. I want God to reveal these mysteries of Jesus Christ. And I want you all to pray for it. Let me just say, say to you today, if you have a pastor, if you have a missionary, if you have a teacher and you are not praying for him or her or them, you need to start praying for them. If you have a pastor, you have a teacher, you have a mentor, you have a preacher, you have a teacher or a, a, a mentor, you need to be lifting them in prayer. Paul says, pray for us. And the number one thing you ought to be praying, that the preacher, the teacher, the mentor, the disciple even, speak the words of God and develop and show forth the mysteries of Jesus Christ. This word mystery means the hidden things. The word mystery means those things that people just can't normally go up and pick up. That's why we have to dive deep into the word. We have to listen to the word. We have to pray the word. We have to read the word. We have to saturate ourselves in the word. Because anything that's valuable, you have to dig deep to find it. You don't find pearls laying on the ocean floor. You have to go deep down into the ocean, find the, the one that carries the pearl in his, in his hard crush, find him, dig into his mouth and pull out the pearl. It's worth working for. It's worth finding. It's worth looking for. And let me tell you, the mysteries of Christ are worth working for. For which I am in chain. He says, open the door. God, open the door. I'm praying that God opens the door. And I want you all to pray that God opens the door so I can begin to share the word of God again. He's not talking about God opening the door so he can get out of prison. Mm -hmm. God opened the door while I'm in prison, I can share the word. In my bad situation, I ought to look for a door for God to open so I can share the word. We want to share the word of God. And we want to reveal the great mysteries of Jesus Christ. Those things that are hidden from normal, everyday men. That's why Paul says in Corinthians... There is no sense of you confronting the natural man with spiritual things. He says, Paul says, don't even present spiritual things to the natural man. Because those things which are spiritual are spiritually discerned and the natural man don't even have the capability, the ability, nor the know-how how to deal with it. Don't, don't, don't even present it. Don't even... Don't even argue with them. Don't even get into a debate with them. There is no sense in getting into a debate with a natural man. Yes, <laughs> you just need to make sure that you pray that God will open the door. And when he opens the door, you will present the, the word of God and you will present the great mysteries of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I want that to happen even though I'm locked up now. Even though that's the reason why I got here. That's the reason why I'm here. I want God to open the door, even though I'm in chain because of it. I want you to pray for it. Verse number four, he says, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Paul says, Paul says, now, I have something to say. And that's the thing. Paul, Paul says, I have something to say. But I need you to pray that God makes a way, open the door means to make a way, that God makes a way for me to be able to say what I got to say. That I may make manifest as I ought to 
speak. In other words, I want you to pray for me so what's in me will come out of me. And when it comes out of me, I need you to be praying that when it comes out of me, I say what God wants me to say. I say it how God wants me to say it. I say when God wants me to say it. I say it in the tone that God wants me to say it. I need you to pray for me. I'm saying to you tonight, I, I, need, I need your prayers. I, I need you to pray for me. I'm saying to you tonight that I need you to pray for me in such a way that, 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 that God opens the door that I can present the word of God, even though men don't want to want to hear it. I can present the word of God in such a fashion that men will eat it up. That God will, God will manifest mean make, make real that, that God will show, uh, show forth these mysteries and, and I'm in bonds because of it. It got me in trouble last time, but I don't know anything else to do. It is, it is one who, who don't know anything to speak but Christ. When he's getting in trouble, he talks about Christ. When, when he's out of trouble, he talks about Christ. When he's out, he knows he's headed for trouble, he's talking about Christ and the great mysteries that Jesus has in store for us. He says, I, I know I'm in bonds about it. I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm caught up in it. I, I know, but I want you to pray that I, I have the right tonation. I want you to pray that I say it at the right time. I want you to pray that I say it in the right words. I want you to pray that my manner is a misright. That I will speak as I ought to speak. Paul says, y'all pray for us. Every person who has a preacher, a teacher, a mentor, a facilitator in their lives ought to be praying for that teacher, preacher, mentor, facilitator. As the facilitator and the preacher, the teacher, the pastor is praying for the disciple. We ought to pray for one another. We ought to keep each other in prayer. We, we ought to keep each other lifted up. We ought to keep each other surrounded with prayer. This is a spiritual happening. I don't get up here on Wednesdays or on Sundays just to have a conversation. And you ought not to want to hear me just have a conversation. In order for you to get the mysteries of God, you ought to be praying for the preacher. In order for you to receive the word of God the way God wants you to receive it and the way God wrote it and the way God intended, you ought to be praying for the preacher. In your prayer time, Paul says you ought to be praying for the preacher. You ought to be praying for those who, who make a living in teaching and preaching the word. You ought to be praying for those who, who has nothing else to say other than Jesus and him crucified. Mm -hmm. You ought to be praying for. Verse number five says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the times. Let, verse six says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. It says in verse 5, walk in wisdom. This word walk means to live. This word walk means to occupy. This word walk means to make progress. In other words, as we conduct ourselves, the word walk means to conduct. As we conduct ourselves, we want ourselves regulated. We don't want to just do anything, say anything, act in a kind of way. We don't want to be a renegade. We see that today. They created a monster. Now the monster is out. And now the monster is out. They can't put him back in the box. Now he has few fanned the flames. Few of the fire. Now millions of people are acting a fool because they develop a monster and now they can't put him back in the box. Even those who developed him can't even coach him to get back in the box. Only a few days left, he's going to burn it down as much as he can. 
He going to burn it down. He, he wants to burn it all down. He says, Paul says in verse number five, walk. Walk in wisdom. Be wise. Yes. Be spiritual. Walk higher than the world. Don't be worldly. Don't act like the world. We know we have two different standards. We know we're living in the midst of two different standards, but don't act like the world. I said, walk in wisdom. Be wise. If you know you have something that is your sin, leave it alone. Don't go out there. Don't frustrate it. Don't develop it. Leave it alone. Let God handle it. Paul says in verse number five, Colossians chapter four, walk in wisdom. Be wise when you do things. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. There are people who are outside the kingdom of God that is watching us. Yes. Paul says walk in wisdom. In other words, live in wisdom. Be wise in how you live because there's an outside world watching you. There's a watching world looking at you. And they want to see you walk in wisdom. And if they don't see you walk in wisdom, number one, they think it's okay to be a fool. Number two, they're looking to make God look bad because they're looking at you. Paul says walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, those who are outsiders, those who are not saved. Walk in wisdom because they're watching you. They're looking at you. Redeeming the times. We live in some terrible times. But we have to get to a point in our lives where we can redeem these times. We can improve these times. This word redeem means to improve, to impact. It also means to buy back. And that's what Jesus did for us. He bought us back. We ought to be in such wisdom and living in such wisdom that we can redeem the time, turn the clock back. We can redeem the time. Folk walk around here talking about make America great again. Let me tell you, no one can make America great again but Jesus. So we have to pray that the word of God goes forth, we, that we will walk with wisdom and live with the conduct that God will have us live in so the times can be bought back again. We need to make sure that we can redeem the times. We can't make America great again leaving Jesus out. We can't even build back better without Christ. If we're going to build back better, the new administration is going to get up, have to get over a whole lot of stuff. But one thing they have to include, and that is Jesus Christ. If we're going to build back better, we got to include Jesus Christ. Verse number six. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. Always let your speech be sweet. This word grace means sweetness. The word grace means pleasant. The word grace means favor. You know, we can say some things and that thing that we say doesn't hurt but it's the way we say it. You can say the same thing over and over again, and one thing will cut a person to death, and the other thing, they are taken with a smile. We're not men pleasers where people have to take what we say with a smile, but Paul says we are to always let our speech be seasoned with favor, with grace, with joy with liberty. Grace, favor, joy, liberty, pleasure. We are let it be seasoned with grace. Then he says, season it with salt. 
Some of you who are from the country, you know when you kill hogs, you have a you have an outhouse in the back where you hang up all the meat and you spray it and mop it down with salt and then you cure it with salt and you leave it hanging up and that salt keeps it. You didn't have to put it in a refrigerator. The salt was a preserving agent. We have to make sure we season our lifestyles with salt. We have to season it with salt. Season our lifestyles with salt. Season our speech with salt in such a way that it's a sweet savor. That you may know how you ought to answer each other. He says, he deals with both the saved and the unsaved. First, he deals with the unsaved. He says the unsaved is watching you. He says, whatever you do, the unsaved is watching you. Be wise and know the unsaved is watching you. And as you deal with the unsaved, you ought to be in prayer that God opens the door for you to present the word of God. And so, so you can have, so you can manifest godly tendencies in your life so that the spirit of God will be transferable to one person to the other. And then he says that we ought to answer one another in such a way that others will see us and glorify his name. Not only are people watching how we treat the unsaved, they're watching how we treat the saved. It is a picture of two brothers or two sisters who would get together at home. But when they go to school, they don't support each other. They get with other people and down the sister or the brother. Talk bad, talk crazy, misuse the sister and the brother. All the time, the other children at school are watching how you treat your sister or brother. I'm saying to you today, be careful how you treat your sister and your brother. Because the ungodly is watching, first of all, how you treat the ungodly. And they are watching, secondly, how you treat your sister and brother, the godly ones. It says we have to redeem the times. This word redeem means to buy back. And that's what Jesus says to us. That's what Jesus did for us. He bought us back. Yeah, it was 2,000 years ago. Jesus the Christ bought us back from the devil. This word redeem means to pay ransom. Jesus paid the ransom for you. And he paid it for me. Yes, he did. Over 2,000 years ago, he died on a skull hill called Calvary. He died for you and he died for me. He bought us back. He redeemed the times. And if you're listening to me today and you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, you need to be saved right here, right now. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. You need to trust him as your savior. He has paid the price for you. He did it over 2,000 years ago. He died on a hill called Calvary. Jesus died, and he died for you, and he died for me. They hung him on the cross. He gave up the ghost, meaning he died. He was all the way dead. And after he died, they pierced him in his side and out came blood and water. The blood was for the redemption of our sins. He died for you. He died for you. And after they pierced him in his side, they took him off the cross. He was already dead. Before they pierced him, he was already dead. They took him off the cross and laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it too long. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. Jesus bought us back. He redeemed the time so we could redeem the times. The door of the church is open. 
If you can believe this story tonight, I want you to bow your head and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just by believing the story and saying, Lord, come into my life and make me a new person. Will you bow your head with me and repeat after me? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried in a borrowed tomb. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We believe if you join us in this prayer, believing the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that you are born again. And when you die, you're on your way to heaven. There may be others of you who are interested and have been interested in God, but you have not been committed to him. This is your moment. You can be committed to God even right now. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you for your sins. If you fall off the horse, you get back up. God is in love with the backslider. If you're in a backslidden position, meaning that if you have walk, a moon walk back from God, Jesus says, come. He paid the ransom for you. He wants you to be dedicated to God. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, we pray for those who have fallen short, those who missed the mark, those who have not been committed to you. We pray that you touch them now, heal them now, bless them now, that they will be followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to walk with them in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. My third appeal is to those who are without a church home or in between church homes. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Whether you're in Houston or in some distant land, you can be a member of the New Beginning Church. Just inbox me, message me, and let me know that you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad to welcome you to your new family of faith. And we pray that you will join us at the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is now offering time. It's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. You can give one of three ways. You can give, first of all, by Cash App. You can give by Cash App. Our Cash App is... Our cash tag is dollar sign NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Or you can give by mailing in your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please mail your offering or your tithes to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Thank you for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. We're in Bible study every Wednesday night at 7.20pm. You can join us by way of Zoom or you can join us here, same station on Facebook Live. And please join us on Sunday morning for our Bible our Sunday school rather, our Sunday school at 9am and our worship service at 1045am. Thank you so much for being a part of our service 
here tonight. We want to also thank you for joining us to our visitors. Thank you for joining us for our daily Bible listening and journaling. Our daily Bible listening and journaling. Uh, we are up to, um, to uh, Genesis chapter 24 on this coming uh, morning. In the morning, we'll be at Genesis chapter 24. Uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, continue to listen to the word of God and journal and write out what God is speaking to you through the word of God. It'll be a blessing for you, be a blessing to you, and you will have great long lives because of it, because God is God and he honors his word. God loves for his students and his children to honor his word because he honors his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will exist from now on. The word of God will exist from now on. So we are reading as well as listening to the word of God throughout this year, starting at Genesis all the way to Revelation chapter 22. Please join us. Uh, please join us. We'll be glad to, to have you a part of our listening program. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, "In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the writings of Paul. We thank you, Father God, that you will open the door, that we will present the word of God, and that we will reveal and make manifest the mysteries of Jesus Christ. We ask you to bless us to have a hunger, a thirst, and a desire for the word of God, that we will present your word to the fallen world, and that this fallen world will be redeemed in the process. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying threefoldly, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.